In section 6.1, we're going to go ahead and revisit the position velocity acceleration. So just remember that we use this s of t for our position function. And when we talk about the position of a function, we're going to assume that our objects are moving along a straight line. So recall that velocity is simply the derivative of the position function. So we're going to look at displacement and distance traveled. Displacement is different than distance traveled. So displacement is how far you are away from your starting position, but the distance traveled is like whatever your path is, right? Displacement would be start to end. So displacement, uh, a little bit different than distance traveled. When we figure out the displacement of an object and we have the velocity, then we can simply integrate to find displacement. But if we want the distance traveled, we have to make sure, because distance is positive, we have to make sure that we take the absolute value of our velocity. So remember the absolute value, if you think about vectors, is just the speed. In example one, we have an object that's moving along a straight line, and we have its velocity in meters per second. Part A says to graph the velocity function on the interval and determine where the motion is positive or negative. So I'm only graphing this from t equal to 0 to t is equal to 4. So just be careful. I know a lot of you, when you graph stuff, you graph the whole thing. And this is a parabola, and it is opening up. And it has x-intercepts at 1 and 4. So it's going to look something like this. But I'm only graphing this from t is equal to 0 to t is equal to 4. Okay. So here at 1 and at 4, that's where the velocity function uh, has our t-intercepts. So the motion is positive where the velocity is positive. And we have positive motion. from 0 to 1. And I'm not going to include 1 because that's actually where the velocity is 0. And the motion is negative from 1 to 4 because that's where the velocity function is negative. OK. In part B, we're supposed to find displacement. So displacement is just the integral. So I'm going to integrate from 1 to 4. Oops, sorry. I'm going to integrate from 0 to 4. Don't know what I'm integrating on. The velocity is t squared minus 5t plus 4 uh, with respect to t. So the integral is going to be t to the third over 3 minus 5t squared over 2 plus 4t. I'm evaluating that from 0 to 4, which is going to be 4 to the third over 3 minus 5 times 4 squared over 2 plus 4 times 4. And I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to subtract when t is equal to 0. But then that's just going to be 0 minus 0 plus 0. So I can kind of ignore that. Because that's just 0. Okay, after doing all the minor math, this is going to be negative 8 third meters. So you could write that as a decimal or a mixed number. But I'll just leave it that way. In part C, we want to find the distance. So the distance traveled 
is going to be the integral from 0 to 4 of the absolute value of t squared minus 5t plus 4. So I actually don't know how to figure that out with the absolute values in the integrand. But think about this logically. All we're doing is we want to make sure our velocity function is always positive. So going back to the graph, that means we're going to break this up into two pieces. From t is equal to 0 to t is equal to 1, the velocity function is positive. So I don't need the absolute values. I'll just integrate from 0 to 1, and that value will be positive. However, from 1 to 4, the velocity function is negative. So how I handle this is I break this up into two integrals. From 0 to 1, I'm fine, because t squared minus 5t. When I integrate that, it'll be positive. However, from 1 to 4, it's negative. So I'm going to take the negative of the integral from 1 to 4. So the negative uh, and negative will turn positive. So distance is a little bit uh, tricky because you have to determine where your function is positive and where it's negative. And where it's negative, you have to take the negative. The integral is going to be the same as before. It's t to the, oops, sorry, third. Sorry, that's a 3. Over 3 minus 5t squared over 2 plus 4t. So this first piece, I'm going to be evaluating from 0 to 1. Minus, the second one is going to be the same, t to the third over 3 minus 5t squared over 2 plus 4t and that's going to be from 1 to 4. Okay. Uh, so when I figure out all of this, and you could just verify the algebra, I'm going to have 19 over 3, and it's distance, so it's going to be meters. Well, let's look at another example. This theorem is position from velocity. So now here, if you have the velocity and you have an initial position, an S sub 0, so that would be when t is equal to 0, then to get your position function, all you have to do is integrate the velocity and add the initial position. All right, in example two, we have this object where we have the velocity, which is six sine t, and we're only concerned with t values from zero to three pi. We have this initial position, though, that s of zero is zero. So that just means when t is zero, the position is zero. Okay, we're going to graph the velocity function, and we're going to determine where the motion is positive and negative. Oh, I want blue. So when I graph this velocity function, it's just a sine graph. Um, the 6 just means that the amplitude is now 6. But the shape of the graph is going to be the same, right? It's sine starts at 0 and then it comes back down and it's zero again at pi and then goes down and then two pi and then it goes up and this is going to, I think I need a longer graph, this is going to three pi. So this would be pi, two pi, and three pi. I can see that at 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, my velocity is 0. So positive motion 
would be where the velocity function is above the t-axis. So remember, this is the t value. This is our velocity. So my positive, oops, motions. Uh, that's going to be t0 to pi. and also 2 pi to 3 pi. And then negative motion is going to be from pi to 2 pi. And all this does, it, this doesn't ask. It's actually stopped at 0, pi, 2 pi, and 3 pi. In part B, we're supposed to find the position function. So we're going to use that theorem to find our position function. And it says that our position function s of t is going to equal to s of 0 plus the integral from 0 to t of, this is 6 sine of x. I have to use a different variable because t is in my limit of integration. And now s of 0 is just 0. And this integral, 6 sine of x is going to become a negative 6 cosine of x. And I'm going to evaluate this from 0 to t. So I don't really care about this 0 here. This is going to be negative 6 cosine of t minus a negative 6 cosine of 0. And that's simply negative 6 cosine of t, cosine of 0 is 1, so this becomes a plus 6. And that would be my function s of t, or my position function. So using this formula means that we're solving for our constant c when we have this initial condition. All right, so we're supposed to graph the position function on the given interval. I'm going to put it right next to the function itself. So if I were to graph my position function, My lines are really bad. It's going to be negative 6 cosine of t plus 6. And if you recall your transformations, the negative means it's going to reflect, but the 6 in front means the amplitude is now 6. Uh, the plus 6 means it's going to shift up. So really what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with something like this. And you could just plug that in your calculator if you wish. So cosine of 0 would be 1. So the negative 6 plus 6, we're at 0. At 2 pi, we're back at 0. And at 3 pi, we're at and here we have 6. For example, uh, so we're going to look at velocity from acceleration. Again, this is something that we had talked about in previous sections. OK. So let's look at uh, another theorem that we have, and this theorem has to do with velocity from acceleration. 
similar to the, our previous theorem with position from velocity. If we do have our acceleration and we have an initial condition on our velocity, then if we integrate, we can go ahead and find our velocity function. In example three, we have an object moving along a straight line. We know its acceleration is five minus t. And we have some initial conditions here with the velocity and with the position. So in this particular example, we want to find our position function and we want to find the velocity function. We want to find them both, but we only have acceleration. So we have to start with the acceleration, integrate to find velocity. So I know my velocity is going to be equal to the initial velocity plus the integral of the acceleration from 0 to t. And here I have to use an x because t is already a variable that's being used in my limits of integration. My initial velocity is 15 plus, uh, when I integrate 5 minus x, I get 5x minus x squared over 2. I'm evaluating this from 0 to t. So we have 15 plus 5 t minus t squared over 2 and then it would be minus the 0 but I'm not going to put that in because that's just 0. Maybe I will just to remind you. So it's upper minus the lower which would be 0 minus 0. And again I can just ignore that. So my velocity function is going to be 15 plus 5t uh, minus t squared over 2. So we were supposed to find velocity and position. Well, my position function from our previous theorem is going to be equal to the initial condition of my position function plus the integral from 0 to t of the velocity which is 15 plus 5t uh, minus t squared over 2. Oh, I did that again. It's supposed to be x's. I do that all the time. Can't use t. And then that would be my initial condition is 10 plus 15x plus 5x squared over 2 minus x to the third over 3. But there's always a, already a 2 in the denominator, so that becomes 6. And I'm evaluating that from 0 to t. So we have 10 plus 15t plus 5t squared over 2 uh, minus t to the third over 6. Now I'm okay if you write the position function this way, uh, but your my math lab might want you to write this as 5 halves t squared plus 1 6 t to the third. They might get real picky about that. All right, so let's look at our last few examples. And instead of looking at our acceleration and our velocity and our position function, what we're going to do now is we're just going to look at um, applying the integrals to any value, not just a position function. So this is just a general formula for any q, which is just some quantity. 
where it's net change. And when we talk about net change, it's an integral. Okay? So if you have a quantity Q, if you integrate its derivative, then that will give you our, your net change. And if you have an initial condition, then it's just the initial condition plus the integral. So now we're just looking at general quantities, not specifically velocity, acceleration, or position. In example four, we have a marginal cost in dollars of producing X items is given by this derivative of the cost function, and we've seen this before. So the derivative of the cost function in this particular case is 6 minus 0.0004x. And the X items that we're producing uh, are just going to be from 0 to 8,000. Okay, so that would be the number of items we're producing. So we want to figure out what the cost of producing 6,000 to 8,000 items would be. And that's just an integral where the lower limit would be the 6,000. The upper limit would be the 8,000. So the limits of integration would be the items that we're producing. And then we're just going to integrate our cost function, or the derivative of our cost function, which would be 6 minus the point zero 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 four x Okay, and we can use dx, because notice that my limits of integration are numbers, not t. So that's simply 6x minus 0 0.0002x squared. Because it'll be 0, 0, 0, 0004x squared over 2. And then I'm just evaluating this. 6,000 would be my lower limit, 8,000 would be my upper limit. All right. So we have 6 times 8,000 minus 0 0.0002 times 8,000 squared, so the upper minus the lower, which is 6 times 6,000 minus 0 0.0002, 6,000 uh, squared. All right, so that just equals, plug that in your calculator, and you'll get a nice number. It's 6,400. So this is a cost, so I'm going to add the dollar sign. And 6,400 dollars would be the cost to produce 6,000 to 8,000 items. All right. Let's look at another example where we would just apply some generic quantity. In example five, we have an initial population of a species of bird. And the initial population is 100. The yearly growth rate, and since we're talking about a rate, that's a derivative. So the rate that the population grows is 10 times 4 minus t. Part A says, what is the bird population in three years? So for part A, we have an initial condition. I'm going to use that second piece of the theorem. This says this population is going to be equal to the initial population plus the integral from 0 to t of 10, 4, minus x dx. Our initial population is 100. This integral, remember we can pull the 10 out and then just look at 4x minus x squared over 2, if we wish, from 0 to t. 
that would be 100. Oops, I don't know why I put 1,000. That's going to be 100 <laughs> uh, plus 10. And then um, when I put in t, that's fine. And remember the zero, if I put in for x in this case, it's just going to be gone. So this is just going to give me 4t minus t squared over 2. So if I was going to write out this population function, I think I'll clean it up a bit and write it as 100 plus 40t uh, minus 5t squared. So it says, what is the bird population in three years? Well, I just found the generic population function. To figure out what the bird population is in three years, all I have to do now is just put in three for t and figure out what that is. Again, I'm just going to plug this into the calculator to get 220 minus 45, so that would be 175 birds. So in three years, this bird population will be 175 birds. When will this species die out? That's the concern of part B. So the species dies out when the population is equal to zero. All I have to do now, since I already have a population function, is set that population function, which is 100 plus 40t minus 5t squared. Just set that equal to zero and solve for t. And I don't like it that way. That irritates me when the squared term is at the end. Now, another thing that irritates me is if there's a negative in front of my squared term. I'm going to divide everything by a negative 5 to get t squared minus 8t minus 20 equal to 0. And then that will factor as 20. So that's going to be 2 and 10 minus 10 plus 2, which means that t is equal to 10 or t is equal to negative 2. So the negative 2 doesn't make sense because we're talking about time. So it looks like in 10 years the bird population will die out. Uh, that kind of makes sense with the numbers that I have. So that's it for 6.1.